One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. We don't want war. We don't want war. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. We don't want war. We don't want war. Not our country, not our oil. Not our country, not our oil. Keep the troops on foreign soil. Keep the troops on foreign soil. Country, not our oil. Not our country, not our oil. Keep the troops on foreign soil. Keep the troops on foreign soil. The largest demonstration world history took place about 17 years ago in February 2003 with half a million in New York City, over a million in London, and millions elsewhere around the world because we had started to stop believing the lies that we were told. Woo -hoo! Yeah. What were these lies? And this is a question because we did not learn them at that time. One was very obvious and we learned, everyone, everyone learned that it was a lie pretty quickly. And that was the lie that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And that lie was... Great. That lie was not just told by the Bush administration. That lie was told by the New York Times. That lie was told by people on the news night after night. That lie was told by college professors. But we learned, when we learned that that was a lie, we didn't just learn that George Bush was a liar, we learned that the vast majority of people in power in this society lie to us regularly about the most important questions of our lives. The second lie was that we went there to liberate. We did not, the United States did not go to Iraq with the UK and other imperialist powers to liberate Iraq. And if you want to see an answer to that question, all you have to do is ask the Iraqis themselves because they will tell you 17 years later that they still want the United States out of their country. The third lie though I think is a little bit more difficult. And this is a deeper lie. This lie was that the Iraqi people, and that Arab people, and that other people outside the United States cannot liberate themselves on their own. That lie, I do not think, was overturned with the Iraq War. The first major crack in that lie was lodged by the Arab peoples themselves in 2011 when they taught the world how to fight back. And when I say taught, I mean people in Minnesota said, wow, if the Egyptians can do it with Mubarak, maybe we can do it with Scott Walker. And they held up signs that said, walk like an Egyptian. The Egyptians occupied Tahrir Square, they occupied their state capital. And that, that is where the occupation of Wall Street came from. It was called Occupy Wall Street because people were, were inspired by the occupation of Tahrir Square. When historians look back at the period that we are moving into, they will see the Arab Spring as the beginning of a, of a new worldwide revival of class struggle. There are no two ways about that. Look around the world today. Just the other day we had tens of millions of people in India demonstrating against climate change. Before that, 250 million workers in India on strike against racist laws. More workers on strike in India than 10 times more workers on strike in India than there were workers at the time that Karl Marx Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto. And this is why I am out here today. Because U.S. out of the Middle East is, more, is, is about more than just stopping death and destruction and horrors and cancer. It is about uniting with our brothers and sisters in Iraq, in Iran, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Afghanistan, in Palestine to join them in this historic worldwide class struggle 
against the most vicious, destructive ruling class we have ever witnessed in humanity's history. And that is why Black Lives Matter. That is why the police attacks on people of color in this state are not irrelevant to this demonstration today. Is because it is part of the same class struggle. It is a part of the same struggle against the oppressors and people who want to prevent the growth of democracy and of a new world. The people who want to maintain the destruction of our planet. The people who want to destroy all of the wildlife in Australia and elsewhere. That is what is at stake. That is one of the most important lies that we need to challenge. The final lie, and this one I think we also did not learn, and we need to relearn what this lie is. And that lie is that the demonstrations that we organize, the movement that we build, does not matter. These, the dirty secret is that these demonstrations, that this movement does matter. But the movement against the war in Iraq reduced the recruitment of American soldiers dramatically. It dramatically reduced the aspirations of our ruling class to invade other countries in the region. It is one of the key reasons why Obama decided not to invade Syria. Why the UK ruling class d decided not to invade Syria is because they knew they did not have the support of the people of their own countries. And they did not have that support because there was a mass movement, people going out weekend after weekend, handing out flyers, standing in the rain, organizing mass demonstrations in D.C., in New York, in California. And that is what we need to bring back. And if we do this, if we commit to this, we will make history, and there is no doubt about that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. All right, up next we have Eric. He's a veteran of the Iraq War, and he's with uh, Central Democratic Socialists of America. Right, Eric. I'm actually, Woo! I'm actually a veteran of Afghanistan, but it's all no worries. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch is taking a couple hits, so I'll, I'll, I'll let him off the hook. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm a, I was a Marine Corps rifleman. I deployed to Afghanistan in the summer of 2011. Uh, I didn't see super heavy combat. I only got shot at the last week I was there, but I certainly saw enough of that war to realize that, you know, just like Dan was saying, just like all of the other people have been saying, we're not over there to help those people. We're not over there to bring them democracy, to make their lives better. What we're over there doing is, well, I kind of found out recently, there's a news article uh, about a month or two ago that found a new resource deposit in Afghanistan, a uh, potential new source of heavy metals, and the geographical survey that discovered those happened while I was in that area, securing that area, for those geologists to go in there and evaluate the resources of Afghanistan for extraction. That was my job there. I didn't find that out until two months ago. At least that was one of my jobs there. So, these are the wars that we're waging. The longest war in American history, unless you count the genocide of the Native Americans as its own war. This war, it became the longest war while I was there. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a real problem and this is not unique to today. This is a continuation of American imperialism that has gone on for generations. <coughs> so, thank you everyone for coming out here in the rain. Uh, I know that it is not everyone's favorite thing. We had a saying in the Marine Corps that if it ain't raining, we ain't training. So, you know, try to uh, remember that next time it's raining and you're thinking about whether or not to come out. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, and, um, I was watching a, uh, an interesting documentary with my dad the other night about uh, Johnny Cash when he went to uh, perform for Nixon at the White House. And something that I learned um, uh, from that documentary was uh, Johnny Cash, when he went to Vietnam, uh, what he saw over there, when he saw the wounded soldiers, when he saw the American boys that he cared so much about, you know, coming back dead and disfigured. When, well, when he came back, he said, you know, people call me a hawk for going over there and performing for the troops. But he said, if you go over there a dove, you're likely to come back a dove with claws. So I want to leave you here today to remember that just because we are about 
fighting for a world with peace does not mean we do not have to fight. Does not mean that we do not have to come out here. And the way that we fight for that stuff is through solidarity, through recognizing the, the way that all these struggles are connected together, the way that racism and imperialism and misogyny and all these things are connected together. The struggle to have a functioning climate for us, you know, so we don't destroy nature. Fighting, overturning imperialism is crucial to all these struggles. And I am so happy to see so many people here that understand this too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you for learning about your service. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Uh, up next, we have Nancy from 350 Connecticut to talk about the link between climate, uh, climate change and war over the last few years, and really back to September 11, 2001, it feels like we have done nothing but pivot from crisis to crisis. Economic crises, housing crises, immigration crises, including the shameful way we are torturing those who would cross into the United States, deportation crusades, police brutality and prison privatization, dismantling of a reliable, independent media, climate catastrophes, all with a backdrop of worsening international relationships, isolationism, and a profound disregard for human rights abuses. We live in a dangerous world. Inequity is reaching catastrophic levels as democracies shrink and oligarchies and dictatorships grow. I'm gonna wait. White supremacy and Euro-American exceptionalism are on full display. The desire to control the planet's resources, including fossil fuels, clean water, and arable land, is spurring conflict after conflict and causing unprecedented habitat destruction and desperate human migration. The U.S. is currently the world's largest oil producer, thanks to environmentally harmful shale oil fracturing. We now also export more oil and gas combined than we import, hence the drive to build cross-continent pipelines. Then why continue to create conflict and threaten war in the Middle East? <laughs> Naomi Klein, in her 2017 book, No is Not Enough, says this about war. There is no faster way or more effective way to drive up the price of oil, especially if the violence interferes with oil supplies making it to the world market. Since 2015, due to increased production, there has been a worldwide glut of oil, keeping prices low. Our oil barons are sitting on untold quantities of oil reserves, waiting for prices to escalate in order to maximize profit. They need disruption in the foreign markets and they need global dependence on fossil fuels. They need to keep demand for fuels high. Conveniently, our military industrial complex is the world's largest institutional consumer of gas and oil, as well as a huge emitter of greenhouse gases. The oligarchs also need crises. Crises create the perfect condition to fan the flames of fear to cause enough confusion that we will look away from the society we want to build and fall for the false claims of national security risks. In fact, our government and the global power brokers it serves are the biggest national security risks. And they want more control over our daily lives. <coughs> the world has faced simil similarly dark and seemingly hopeless days before. But out of those depths, ordinary people found strength and courage to fight back and to fight for a better future. Frankly, I am scared by the trends. Made worse, these trends are made worse by what appears to be an all-out drive toward the cliff on the part of the super powerful. All of us gathered here give me hope, or at least encouragement, to keep working at building a future that is much different from the present. We need to throw off the yoke of consumerism, 
and the tyranny of continual economic growth, find our way to rejecting fossil fuels, yank our government back from its belligerent and warring ways, put an end to all forms of social injustice, establish community control of our police force, slash the inequity and in wealth both within our country and around the world. Each of these is a tall order. Now I know the weather has affected the size of the crowd today, but even on a sunny day, there are not enough of us mobilized. To have any chance at success, we need more people, more interconnecting of issues and activists, more fear about the right things. We have the vision, we have the conviction, now we need the uprising. That is our biggest challenge today. Thank you for all that you do and don't stop. Thank you, Nancy, very much. Up next, we have John from the uh, Tree of Life Education Fund. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and thank you for being out here on this rainy afternoon. Um, I just want to say a few words. Uh, most of the work that I'm involved in is, is uh, solidarity with the people of Palestine. And uh, just want to point out that the same forces that brought us to war in Iraq, the same forces that keep us involved in an improper war, a wrong war in Afghanistan, the same forces that brought an end to the Iran deal, the same forces that want us to go to war with Iran are the same forces that are also involved in uh, oppressing the Palestinian people. Um, and we need to all stick together. We need the solidarity of everyone on all of these fronts in order to change our society because this is where the change has to occur here in America. We are the heart of imperialism and this is our struggle. We owe it to ourselves, to our families, to our children but we also owe it to the rest of the world to clean up the mess here. And uh, there's a big mess. And we'll, we'll, we'll see another mess coming uh, on Tuesday. Uh, Trump is going to announce, uh, apparently, you know, his deal of the century. His deal of the century, um, you know, is supposed to be a peace deal that is supposed to solve the Palestinian-Israeli issue. He's arrived at this deal without any involvement of the Palestinians. You know, and, and the deal is simply going to be more annexation, more oppression, more displacement, more death and destruction. It's the same thing that we're facing in, with the situation in Iraq, the situation in Iran, the situation in Afghanistan. So I just wanted to, to point that out and ask for your solidarity and involvement you know, in the struggle for, for peace and justice in Palestine and Israel. Um, the second point I want to make related to this is that we have a bill in Congress right now. It's one of the only bills uh, that is pro-Palestinian that's been uh, endorsed and co-sponsored by 23 Congress people so far. And the bill is H.R. 2407. And it simply says that of the $3.8 billion of our taxpayers that go to Israel every year, that none of that money should be used for the arrest and detention of Palestinian children. Every year, five to 700 Palestinian children are arrested and subject to torture. Many of them are arrested in the middle of the night, uh, tied, brought to a detention center, interrogated in a language that they don't understand, Hebrew, and forced to sign confessions. Betty McCollum from Minnesota introduced this bill to say no more money, no U.S. money should be used for these purposes. Um, Maxine Waters was the most recent uh, congresswoman to sign on, so there's 23 co-sponsors. We have met in Connecticut with all of our congressional representatives, uh, Deloro, Himes, uh, Larson here in the first district, Hayes, um, Courtney, and we brought large delegations to meet with them about this bill and asked them to co-sponsor. And so far, none of them have, with a drop of a footnote. Rosa Delora's office signed on to the bill, and then 10 days later, under extreme pressure from the Zionist lobby, she backed off and took her name off of it. But please, I'm going to circulate cards that's got a phone number. I want you all to call that phone number and tell 
your congressperson to please co-sponsor H.R. 2407. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Occupation is a crime! Occupation is a crime! From Iraq to Palestine! From Iraq to Palestine! Occupation is a crime! Occupation is a crime! From Iraq to Palestine! From Iraq to Palestine! All right, thank you very much. Up next we have Kyle Spaulding. Uh, he's came all the way from the Putnam area today to speak a few words. All right, so my name's, is this working? Okay, my name's Kyle Spaulding. I was a, uh, a leader in Quiet Corner DSA for a couple of years. I was a leader in Quiet Corner DSA for a couple of years and I'm also a Marine Corps veteran. Uh, when I was 19, I decided to drop out of school and join the military. I truly believed I could serve a better purpose and do something to better my community, but I couldn't have been more wrong. I was never taught a single lesson about how we were going to help the people in Iraq and Afghanistan. We were taught that all of the people from these regions were radical Islamists. We would only refer to these people using slurs. Every day we rationalized and normalized violence. Every day we broke formation and we would shout, kill babies. It doesn't take much to figure out which babies we were talking about. I see this racist and violent attitude seeping into our society every day. Those attitudes are exported overseas and then reintroduced to our communities. We will never end racist violence at home if we don't end it as abroad as well. Training young men and women to have these terrible attitudes is necessary to the endless wars in the Middle East. Constant desens desensitization is necessary to make sure we're ready to kill because the goal has always been to cause chaos where we invade, never to bring peace. The military's total disregard for human life isn't only applied for those we call enemy. I was gravely injured in 2010 during training. I had a heat stroke and my organs shut down. I now have permanent health complications. When I had this injury, I was treated as if I was some kind of faker and a waste of human life. They set an example of me to show the rest of the troops what would happen to them if they also revealed an injury. The culture of inhumanity and disregard for human life in the U.S. military oh, I'm sorry. The culture of inhumanity and disregard for, for human life the U.S. military shows towards the enemy is unsurprisingly also affected how our own troops were treated. This system relies on dehumanization and it spares no one. I am inspired today by the people of Iraq who after 30 years of war and sanctions uh, who see an opening to oppose U.S. militarism and rising, and they're rising up in the millions now. Now is the time for all you working people of the world to put an end to the U.S. war machine and unite. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. 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 All right, thank you, Kyle. Up next, we have Nelson Neem uh, to say a few words. Assalamu alaikum everyone, uh, my name is Nazanin and um, my family is Iranian and I have a, over a hundred members of my family in Iran right now and the first thing I'll say which is I feel missing at these like these kinds of spaces is I stand with my people in their struggle in the hardship they're facing for fighting a 40 years of a brutal counter-revolution in the midst of having U.S. guns pointed at them, knowing that even if they overthrow this government, which they do, uh, will want to, and they will, and they will succeed, that there's still guns pointed at them, and this war machine's still a threat to them. We have to get past this rhetoric that um, our struggles are inherently separate, because we have to understand that the, the current regime is rude, brutal, a ruthless theocracy, but it's been saved twice by U.S. intervention. When it came into power, they had no, they had very little public support. Its grip on power was tenuous. It had to kill lots of people to stay in power. But then the Iran-Iraq War happened, at the, where Iraq invaded Iran at U.S. guidance. 
and it created this culture of martyrdom and hyper-nationalism that helped the regime survive. Then, as it was starting to collapse again in the late 1900s, the Iraq War happened. And the U.S. destabilized Iraq so much that Iran was able to make Iraq its de, its de facto colony. Um, and able to like use neoliberal mechanisms to, uh, to help itself. So when we're saying, seeing these people claim they're against the Iranian regime, they need to understand the sanctions, they hurt working people, they hurt everyday people, and the criminals who run the regime are just fine. They, they're part of the same neoliberal order, Russia's got their back, and Russia works with the US. Uh, so we need to stop looking at this in terms of geopolitics or this war machine and this war machine and have a stance that stands with the people. That means following their struggle, listening to their stories. Iran has had multiple kinds of protests. It's had people just trying to provide flood relief and getting punished for it because they were doing a better job than the government. Some teachers were doing this. There were labor strikes in southwestern Iran, which has been the hotbed of a political struggle. Where I see Avaz, an Arab majority city that lives under functional apartheid. It's the most air polluted city in the world and it's a military occupation. Before the protests, before the whole situation here, there have been a year of protests there where workers have been taking over factories and getting kicked out and then being brutalized for it. And so we need to make the connection with the environmental movement being this dirty energy policy um, that is used by all these military occupations from Gaza to Kashmir to Avaz and many places in the world. So I think the most important thing is to keep up with their struggle. If the US decides to back down, that's not the end of the struggle because people have multiple war machines threatening them. People in Iraq are demanding the withdrawal of both US and Iranian troops. That's right. And so one thing I was going to suggest, um, I know a panel of people speaking tomorrow. Uh, it's a panel on Middle Eastern feminism. It's called Me uh, Live Socialist Feminist Panel of Middle Eastern and there's a Chilean woman speaking too, where they're going to talk about the future of the Middle East and protest movements. I have a flyer. It's something you can go on the website and stream live. And the other flyer I have is about Iranian political prisoners, where um, you know, I, I'm in multiple causes where I, I'm against the Iranian regime, I organize against them, and I organize against war. And unfortunately, these movements don't always seem to connect. So what I say is sometimes you have to look past your theory and just listen to people's stories. Um, Ismail Bakshi is currently in an Iranian prison. He organized workers who were not particular ideologues, not socialists, but they were very upset because they weren't getting paid. He made a connection between international struggles and organized workers and is in prison for it. Uh, Sepi de Golian is a very courageous woman. She did journalism for the protest. And the journalism, I was following it, cut off randomly because she was taken into prison. And now we don't know what's going on with these factories. So we have to highlight people's stories and put pressure on all military powers to end not just wars as we know it, but a culture of conflict, of violence, of brutality, of destruction. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. All right, just a couple more speakers and then and then we'll get out of the rain. All right, up next I have um, Lyle Rubin, uh, who's a veteran of the Afghanistan war and with the, uh, was with the United States Marine Corps. All right, thanks, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I served in Afghanistan in 2010. I was there for a year. I was a signals intelligence officer. I'd been trained at the NSA, um, and my job was to basically visit a number of my Marines. I had about 80 of them uh, spread across an area of operations the size of basically Connecticut. And it was during those travels and, and going on foot, patrol, foot patrols and other operations with my Marines um, that I saw our Marines get hurt and killed. And then, uh, more lastingly for myself, I saw Afghans get hurt and killed. And I took part in, in those killings. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. I want to talk about something else. Um, since Soleimani's assassination, we've heard a lot about escalation and de-escalation. And I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Because this happens a lot, where our leader, whether it's um, President Trump or before him, President Obama, uh, almost goes to war with someone, whether it's Assad in Syria, whether it's the Iranian regime. And at first we hear a lot about escalation. Is, is the president going to escalate? Is the US government going to escalate? And then at some point there's de-escalation. And then the media celebrates the de-escalation. 
and everyone's like, oh, we, 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 uh, you know, we, we protect, we, we um, avoided catastrophe this time. And what I learned in Afghanistan, if there's one thing I learned, it's that our system is escalatory. Our system is a system of escalation. And catastrophe isn't something that we're always avoiding. It's something that's already here. It's something that's here every day for so many. In America, in Afghanistan, in Iran, in Iraq, in Palestine. When I was in Afghanistan, like I said, I saw people get hurt and killed. But I also saw hundreds of children undernourished and malnourished chasing our vehicles, begging for water. I saw children terrified hiding behind trees as we patrolled by them or as we shot into the distance. I saw our farmers um, look the other way or run away um, whenever our vehicles or our patrols went by. And there's one thing I remember in particular. I remember being on one outpost and I remember looking at the flagpole and you had the American flag and it was shiny and it was you know, well kept. And then you had the Afghan flag next to it and it was in total tatters. It was broken in half. And I, I remember that moment especially because I think it really spoke to American empire and to the American mentality uh, in general. You know, it, we, it, it's not about Afghans. It's not about the rest of the world. It's about America. And as long as our flag stays on high in perfect condition, that's all that really matters. Um, so, uh, I, there's just one, one final point I want to make. Uh, when I came back from Afghanistan with a very different politics and a very different worldview, I started getting involved in, in, in politics uh, and a lot of different in parts of politics. And, you know, when Black Lives Matter happened and, and then Standing Rock. And, um, you know, the pipeline in Standing Rock, that's a form of escalation. Um, pipelines across, you know, being built across indigenous lands, that's a form of escalation. Cops in over-policed neighborhoods across America, that's a form of escalation. Our entire economic system, um, you know, the workplaces that people have to go to every day, or the workplaces people can't even, can't even go to that, can't even go to every day. The, the millions that are unemployed or underemployed, that's escalation. Um, so I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, no war with Iran, with Iran and, and the end to American capitalism and Amer American empire. All right, thank you. Up next we have uh, Stan from uh, Promoting Enduring Peace. And, and then one more after that and we can all get out of the rain. I'm with uh, Promoting Enduring Peace and the Middle East Crisis Committee that started in 82 about Palestine. I heard, uh, I came late, but I heard somebody talk about working on these anti-war stuffs for 35 years. And they got a kind of a chuckle. I remember my first rally, 1966, so that beats that. It's the year I was born, so yeah. <laughs> Youngster. Anyway, these anti-imperial struggles have gone on for many years, and they were successful. We, we ended that Vietnam War, the, the protests ended it, and the troops ended it by refusing to fight. That's a story you're not going to learn in the history books. But you can see movies like Sir No Sir on YouTube that explain the incredible anti-war actions of soldiers. And some of the wars we didn't stop, but we may have slowed them down. We, we may have ended them sooner or made them think a little more about going into things quickly. For instance, when they did the Iraq War 2003, they were thinking of going right next in to Iran. But there, there were protests about that. There was lectures, demonstrations, all kind of things that, that actually were. So, you know, these things do matter. On Iran today, I would say two things. Trump shut up and complete solidarity with the Iranian people. The first one is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, he's an incredible, utter hypocrite. Uh, if he wanted to help Iranians, he would let them in the United States. He would stop denying the, the, the ability of refugees to come here. Um, 
he would stop the sanctions on Iran. Now, I know a bunch about sanctions in Iraq in the 1990s when they wouldn't allow Iraqi oil to be sold, when the people died, when the kids died by the thousands and the tens of thousands, when Madeleine Albright got on to 60 Minutes, when they had, for some reason, a moment of truth. 60 Minutes and she said it was worth it to do this so that we don't have to fight the Iraq war again and tens of thousands more, hundreds of thousands died children in Iraq. So these sanctions that are the sanctions against a, a country that are really hurting people. I remember under Obama the sanctions that that uh, that you know plane parts. Planes crashed in Iran because they couldn't get the right parts. And this was the liberal Obama that was doing that stuff. Alright that stuff you know maybe I'm repeating what you heard from other people. But to echo Nazanin, there's more, there's more that we have to face. There's more than one enemy. There's lots of enemies out there. These regimes in the Middle East, kings, you know, like Saudi Arabia, and these dictators that, that come in in these various countries, and the regime in Iran. Now, I'll just talk a bit about Iraq. The people in Iraq have been demonstrating for a couple months and the government there is just shooting them down. And they've been, their main thing is get the foreigners out, the U.S. and the Iranians. The Iranian government that has so much influence and power there. And the Iraqi people don't want it. Now with the U.S. they've been very clear. You know, they, after this last thing, the, the, um, the parliament said U.S. troops get out. The prime minister said, U.S. troops get out. Then the president of Iraq about five days ago in Davos met Trump face to face and he said, take your troops home. And then the people yesterday, I don't know if you saw the picture, I don't know if ABC had a picture of it, immense crowds of people saying the U.S. should go home. So all these foreign powers in Iraq should get out there should get out of there and let Iraqi people run their own country. Solidarity with the people, not with the regimes. Yeah. Free Palestine. Trump, shut up. Woo! All right, thank you, Stan. And uh, I'll close it off with a few words from, uh, from myself. And then uh, we can get out of the rain, out of the cold. All right, so my name's Mitch Link. Uh, me and a few others got together because we saw that there's, there was not really an anti-war movement here in Hartford. So we came together to, to, to plan this rally, which is a national day of action, to say U.S. hands off Iran, U.S. out of the Middle East, okay? I joined the Marine Corps when I was 17. I believed at the time that uh, all the ads that they show, you'll be part of a family, you're going to bring democracy to the world. You're not going to have to wonder about whether or not your life mattered because you're going to do something bigger than yourself. So I went to Iraq in March of 2006. And it wasn't long before I realized that was all lies. This moment uh, stands clear in my mind. We're patrolling through the city of Fallujah and some kids, maybe 15, 16 years old, took some shots at us from a rooftop and ran off. We took cover in a house and this wave washed over me that I had so much more in common with those kids that were shooting at me, regardless of where we grew up, what religion we followed or didn't, what language we spoke, our economic status. I had more in common with those kids than I did with anyone who decided we should be there shooting at each other. So as my time in Iraq came to a close, I started to have thoughts. Did we make Iraq a better place? No. Absolutely not. For the trillions of dollars we spent in Iraq and Afghanistan, is the world a more just or equitable place? Absolutely not. For the 700,000 Iraqis that died, is the world a better place? No. For the 22 veterans that commit suicide in this country every single day from the trauma of fighting unjust wars for a country that forgets about them as soon as they get home? 
What are we doing? The military's ad campaigns are strong. They're powerful. They tell us things that we want to hear. And it is an economic draft. The rich kids aren't going off to war. It's people who come from broken homes. It's people who come from rundown schools in urban environments. The highest percentage of people that go into the military out of any ethnic group, Native Americans. A little odd considering America was founded on their exploitation and extermination. Millions of young people believe in the highly refined ad campaigns the, mil the military puts out. But we know those fossil, those are lies. And those falsehoods are crystal clear when we saw the Arab Spring. Millions came out to protest for democratic rights. And America, the American government, did it crush them by any means ne necessary. Whether that was backing a despot or bombing the country into fragments like Libya. But here, like Dan said, working people managed to learn from the revolts across the sea. Just like he said, Americans saw the occupation in Tahrir Square and set up occupations in their state capitals in a small park in Wall Street. And they started a discussion about class that will continue to this day. Today, folks, we rally with over one million Iraqis that took to the streets yesterday to demand the U.S. military and the Iranian military leave Iraq and that the U.S. military leaves the Middle East in general. If bringing democracy to Iraq was ever, ever part of the plan, the military would by, abide by Iraqi's parliament, by their prime minister, by their president, on the call to close the military bases and the troops to go home. But we know it was never about democracy. It was about controlling a resource, oil, that every scientist says we need to stop using right now. A resource that is closing the viability of human beings on this planet. And we know, we have to know here together, that our power does not come from legislative halls in D.C. and workers in Iraqis power doesn't come from legislative halls in Baghdad. It comes from the working class. It comes from people coming together and saying no more of this. We will shut this down. <laughs> We run this country. Working people make everything run. We can stop everything too. We need to remember our lessons from the Vietnam War. That together, we're unstoppable. Together, we can do whatever we want. <clears throat> Today, as we rally together, folks, to stop war, to end exploitation, to stop police, police brutality, and to bring real democracy back to these streets, I know, unlike the military, I have found my family. And it is the international working class. We are siblings in this fight, all of us. No matter our language, no matter our culture, no matter what religion we follow or don't, when we come together, nothing can stop us. Because when the working class fights, it wins, and we must continue this fight. I want to thank everyone for coming out. I know it was a cold, rainy day. I'm very happy everyone's here. There's some sign-up sheets if you want to get involved with more planning for more actions, to come together to grow, to build a broad anti-war movement, to build a broad anti-police brutality movement, to build a broad climate movement, because these are all interlinked. So come together with me, siblings, and we'll fight. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.